Well, thanks you guys for coming. I appreciate the interest in this project. I've been working on this project since 2003, when I started as a junior as an undergraduate. And it's been done a lot with Steve Warren and Carol Hahn, who are actually, these two, who uh, are actually the, really the owners of the project. And I was hired on as an undergraduate helper just to look for signals and trends in the data set. And it wound up becoming a bit more than that as we found more and more interesting things to study. And this should go forward. All right. So a brief overview of the motivation and why we do cloud climatology. So the cloud record lets us infer more about the climate than just a temperature record. With the cloud record, you have a good measure of what the weather was actually like, not just what the temperature was. And you get an idea of where storms may have been taking place, where inversions are, where fair weather is, where, you know, where it's not cloudy. It might tell you where you have descending motion. So you get a lot more information about the climate using the cloud record than you would from just surface obs of, of, say, temperature or humidity, things like that. And clouds are important not just because they can tell you what's going on where, but also they can affect and feedback on the surface temperature. So clouds can obviously block the sun. They can reflect light and cool the surface. But they can also warm the surface in many cases, like at night or in the Arctic night especially. You wind up with clouds that are there that otherwise wouldn't be, and you have a strong downwelling infrared signal going on from the mid-levels in the troposphere that otherwise wouldn't be there. So if you have cloud cover in a normally cold environment, you may actually see a warming from it. So the feedbacks are, are interesting and go in different directions and need to be studied really carefully. And I'm interested in clouds too because they provide a measure of climate variability that is totally independent of temperature observations. So you can look for signals in climate change that are not just from temperature record, but from actually the cloud record, which tells you where storm tracks are, where the Hadley cell may be set up, and all of the different things about the circulation that you otherwise wouldn't see. So before satellites, and even ongoing, clouds were observed from the surface, from weather stations all over the world. And they were done by people at, weather, at trained observers at weather stations, filling out forms like the one down here on the lower right where you just fill out a line that tells you how much cloud cover at what level there is and among other different weather observations. So these predate satellites by several decades and are still available in this data set. So these observations, they have a longer period of record than a satellite product. And they definitely give us a better way to estimate long-term variability since we can go back into the 70s and before over the ocean. So over land, our data set begins 1971 and over the ocean 1952, which is a pretty good chunk of time. And these surface OBS offer other unique cloud information that you can't even get from satellites, like your cloud type, which gives you some idea of the thermodynamic structure of the atmosphere. So if you have a persistent stratus, you might you'll be aware that you have a strong inversion in place. So you get an idea of what's going on, not just at the surface, but above the surface, up into the mid-troposphere. Or you can see, you know, cumulus, cumulonimbus, you know you have instability going on. Um, our, ops, our OBS offer a bottom-up perspective on cloud cover. So in satellite OBS, in many cases, you have a picture looking down that's obscured by high cirrus almost entirely. With surface observations complementing that, you get an idea of what's going on above and below. And then we also have an, an estimate of cloud base height, which is something you really can't find anywhere else that winds up giving you a lot of idea about humidity and temperature profiles and what's going on in the atmosphere. So each of these reports in this climatology, which I think is about 350 million total. Yep? Okay. Uh, so how do they do the uh, cloud base? It's an estimate. So there are different range bins, basically. I think it's a number between one and nine. And so one would, would represent like a low stratus, like 50 to 200 meters, and it would be 100 to 200. I'm probably getting the boundaries wrong, but it's not like they look up and say it's 450 exactly. It would be in a range bin that would give you some idea. And we definitely are a little bit dubious about those, because I don't know how you'd ever get it accurate. But so we, we don't really focus on base height in this climatology, but it's there if you want to look at it. Okay, oh, what about the near the airports? No, I'm sure they, they must have. Yeah, you have new, new LIDAR observations, so those are really useful. We don't use those in this data set because this is about the human observed clouds, because you can get the type information, and unfortunately the LIDAR record isn't compatible with this human observation record. If you tried to just parse one under the other, you'd have a huge discontinuity, and you wouldn't be able to look for trends and signals like that. 
So we would hope to actually incorporate the LiDAR stuff into this at some point, but it would take a lot of reprocessing. So what the, and by the way, just if you have a question, ask right away. I have no objection to talking about stuff as I go on. So what these synoptic reports contain is a estimate of the total cloud amount, which is the sky dome cover above the observer, the amount of the lowest cloud available if there's more than two types. So if you have an underlying cumulus with a stratus above it, it gives you the amount of the low and of the above that they can estimate from what they can see. Uh, you get cloud types at three levels. So at low, middle, and high levels, there are 10 types each in the original observations. So 30 possible cloud types. And we actually pare those down. Well, I'll discuss that later on because 30 is a little bit too much to, to study in this project. We have the base site estimate. We have a present weather indicator, which is useful to tell you if it's raining, if the sky is obscured, if you have lightning, things like that. And we have other, other meteorological variables like temperature, dew point, pressure, wind speed, and direction that complement the cloud ops. So we can look at individual stations and see, see if certain types correspond to certain temperatures and certain wind directions and speeds, things like that. And the OBS are usually taken every six hours at 06, 12, and 1800 UCC. Usually at land weather stations versus ships, they're also taken at 3, 9, 15, and 2100. So you wind up with eight samples per day. So here's the location of our stations that we've chosen. And you can see basically a population density map, more or less. Areas that are densely populated have a lot of weather stations, especially Europe and China and East Asia, and less populated places just have fewer weather stations. So places like Western Australia or the Sahara really have minimal observations. Yeah? So all these people that are doing uh, cloud observations around the world, they all follow the same protocol? They yeah, they're... Through same kind of training? Exactly. They go through the same training, which in each c it winds up that every country is a little bit different, and we discuss some discontinuities because of that. But overall, they're supposed to take the same tests and they fill out the same forms with the same information. And it doesn't, doesn't happen everywhere. This is a huge subset of the number of stations actually out there. These are the stations that, well, the next slide discusses it. The stations that have a consistent record of reporting cloud types. They're very persistent and very sort of agreeable. So we, we assume the record from these stations is more continuous than from other places. Because there's definitely more stations to draw from. So. In some places, like the middle of Africa, where there was just no one living for years and years, and Western Australia, things like that, we've relaxed some of our standards and allowed some, I guess, less reliable stations into the climate record just to have some data there versus nothing. But for the most part, we have pretty good sampling over the course of our time period, up until the mid-90s, where there's some issues over North America. So we also moved or got rid of any stations that moved. So if you have a station, say, that's out in the middle of a, of a meadow somewhere and someone wants to build something there and they move it, this would cause there to be a discontinuity in the cloud record, so we get rid of stations like that as well. And the original data from the project is actually sourced from three different places. In the 70s, it came from a Navy product, this Fleet Numerical Oceanogra Oceanography Center. Then NSEP provided OBS for a long time, but they started to have some problems with their record keeping, and so we moved to this integrated surface data set. So, the project actually involves cloud record from three different original sources that were all brought to us and processed to be agreeable to each other. And we also have ocean observations, and this is a map showing, I guess, observation density over the world oceans. This is number of observations per year per five by five degree grid box. And what you can see really immediately is ship tracks, basically. Wherever ships are most common, we have a lot of cloud observations. So places like the North Atlantic, North Pacific are really well sampled. You have great climatology data there. Southern Ocean is not very well sampled at all. You may only get a couple samples per year on average with very few ships traversing that area. So Ryan, uh, after 2009, what happens? We haven't updated the record yet. I worked on this project from 2003 to 2013. And so one of my jobs in 2010 was to update the record through 2009. We just haven't had funding to update it any further. And there's, there's a lot of weather stations that are beginning to drop off the, uh, basically the global network. So either observers are being replaced by LIDAR, which are discontinuities, or the stations are moving too many. Like too many stations are moving 
which just doesn't allow for a continuous record. So after 2009, I'd love to see it continue, but I'd be worried you'd lose a number of good stations. You'd wind up just declining and declining in, uh, in quality. Mm. But anyone who wants to do it is certainly welcome to work on it. But as you'll see, it's not trivial. So the ocean observations are taken aboard mostly merchant vessels over the oceans. Uh, also in the Arctic, there are observations that come from floating weather stations. So the Russians and the Americans to a lesser extent actually set up drifting sea ice weather stations that were manned. They would just stick a whole bunch of people out in the sea ice. They would, you know, ostensibly for science purposes, but it's a Cold War period, so you have to look at these things differently. And they would just ride the sea ice until it started to break up, and then they'd be evacuated and moved to a different part of sea ice and just keep drifting with it. So this, this record wound up being pretty good. The scientists who were out there on these floating stations did a good job. And so we have data from the Arctic starting in the 50s going through at least the 90s before the Russian government broke up and sort of shut it down. So our ocean data is sourced just from one place, this ICOADS outfit that is still archiving these things, and they're actually continuing our data set on right now. So the ship observations, because we're not relying on certain land stations, can continue more easily. As, you can, as long as someone's archiving them, you can just keep it going. So that's happening. And our differing land and ocean time spans are because over land, they didn't adopt the 1949 WMO synoptic reports until much later, sort of universally. So we couldn't make a global climatology until, sorry, until 1971. But individual countries may go back as far as the 50s or even the 40s. So there's more to be done here too if you want to, going back in time. So what we do is we take all these reports and translate them into a single sort of homogeneous archive so called the Extended Edited Cloud Report Archive. So this is using land stations and, and ships in separate data sets. And we process and quality control the observations. We do consistency checks. So if cloud observations show, say, no cloud cover, but it's also shown to be raining, that would get kicked out of the data set. And we'd question that station a little bit more. So, and if you say, if say there were no cloud reported, but a bunch of types were filled in, we would also kick that out. So there's a whole bunch of code that gets rid of those. And then we actually add some cloud types to the data set, because sometimes you'll get reports of the sky being obscured, but you'll also get heavy rain with thunder. So you can infer from the weather and from the rain that there was a cumulonimbus presence. So we, can, so we add to the data set by giving them these additional types when these certain weather conditions are observed. And if upper levels are obscured by low clouds, we just assume a random overlap assumption, which I won't get into, but basically it means if you can't see the upper level, you don't report it as zero, you just don't report it at all. So it doesn't go into the archive. So there's fewer observations of high cloud than there are of low cloud. And because the Earth is dark half the time, we take into account the illuminance from the sun and the moon before adding any observation to our climatology. So we archive all the reports, but we also provide an illuminance variable that tells you whether or not it was bright enough to actually observe the cloud cover. There's actually a paper on it. I think it's Hahn 1995. Carol Hahn wrote it that, that goes into great detail as to how they did that work. So if you're curious, it's been very seriously studied. So we're using observations that were only well illuminated by the sun and the moon. And all this data is freely available at University of Washington. It's on this site. And the raw ops or the ECRA is available as a monthly text file, or we just updated it to these new nice vectorized NetCDF files. So if you want to get this cloud record to a single station, you can just go download that station's data and look back as far as you want. Much easier to use than the old data. So how do we go from individual irregular observations to an actual climatology. This case is just a simple climatology of low cloud frequent or yeah, low cloud fraction over the oceans, starting from you know lines of data. So to create an average within any confined region, we first set up a minimum number of observations. You can't just have a you know single observation at a station give you good enough data to make a climatology out of. So when we do long-term means, like long-term climatological average data, we require that at least 100 observations are present every season over the entire record, so you have a pretty good sample to draw from. If we're looking at yearly data, we typically require 50 observations during each day, night, day, night combined. 
so that each yearly data point has at least 50 OBS contributing to it. And to compute an average is also not trivial since you're going from these octa observations that are in eights for each cloud type. How do you move you know, those into an actual average amount? What we do is for each type, we compute an average amount when present. And then we also compute the average frequency that type is observed and multiply the two. And you wind up with an amount that is the amount when present times the frequency. So our example is if you have 30% sky cover by cumulus cloud cover that is present 40% of the time, then you would wind up with only 12% amount. So that's what these amounts are telling you. And these, we've computed all these, all these long-term climatologies, and they're available for ocean and land for anyone who wants to download them. There's hundreds of maps like this with numbers on them and all kinds of codes and things so you can go back and reference the data and actually download the data files if you want. And they're all on our website, the cloud map website I showed earlier. So these are available for anybody who wants to use them, and they're available within these equal area grid boxes where you can see we have these five by five degree grid boxes that where each cloud amount is shown. And as you go towards the poles, the longitude bounds actually increase. They widen because the area you know, decreases in a five by five degree box. So we try to keep the actual area of each observation box equal by widening those boundaries. Same over the ocean. So how do we go from that and from these individual stations to actually calculating trends and time series of cloud cover. So this is hard because, as you can see in this Caribbean map down here, you have irregular station spacing, and you have other problems like stations just stop, stopping reporting for a couple years and coming back online, which happens quite a bit. So to deal with these irregularities, there's several steps you have to take to be careful to not introduce discontinuities. And the first thing you have to do is convert your cloud record, so within a five by five degree box down here, we're looking at time series at each station. So each red dot is a station, each faint yellow red line is a station's time series. So we convert everything to anomalies. This way, if you're averaging within the box and a certain station drops out, it's dropping out won't affect the record with the discontinuity. So if, say if you had five stations contributing, one of them suddenly drops off and that station had a lower mean than the average of the area, if you were just computing the average, you would wind up with discontinuity in that grid box just because the station dropped out, not because the cloud cover changed. So you've got to be really careful of these issues since the stations are not that reliable. And so within each box, after we convert to anomalies, we, convert, we calculate the mean anomaly time series. And then we do that for every grid box that has data in it, which is still difficult because then you, are, you still have irregularities that have to be dealt with, so it has to all be in anomalies. But you also, in this case, we're trying to look at you know, cloud cover time series just over land. And when we're averaging these grid boxes together, there's different land cover in each grid box, and each box is a different size. So to contribute to the time series globally, we have to take into account the, the land cover and the grid box size differences. So we weight the average of each box time series by its land cover and by its relative area to produce a single time series for that whole area. So it's a bit messy, but this is the way we found that was most bias-free in trying to actually create a time series. So there's a lot of unique challenges from service observations, and I've got quite a few slides on it, so if, if we're short on time, let me know and I can skip a few of them. But this is really the bulk of working with these observations was dealing with all the interesting quirks of, of the surface obs. So one of them... Before you get into the quirks, Ryan, um, the, in the previous slide, um, you're showing the air mean of the total cloud amount since 1971 for land, and it's showing a decline. Yeah, this is just for the, this region here. So this is just over the Caribbean. Yeah, we're not into that, that whole can of worms yet. Okay. This is just an example of how to, how to compute that without introducing too much bias into the, into the actual trend. So this example could be anywhere, but it's, yeah, but it is showing a trend over the Caribbean that's pretty interesting and looks pretty smooth. But we don't, this is one of those things where you see it, but no one has time to in, investigate every one of these things. So it'd be great if somebody wanted to check it out. But what this shows is that the record is actually fallible to volcanic eruptions. This is the high cloud record from 1971 to 2009 between 50 degrees north and south latitude. And what you see are big minima 
after eruptions in 1982 and 1991. And we don't think the volcanoes are actually causing the high clouds to decline. Instead, we think that they're obscuring the view of the clouds because you have a white stratosphere instead of a blue blue sky. So wispy, thin, cirrus clouds are much less visible when you have a white background. So you have to be aware of these kinds of issues. If there's an eruption, you might get a discontinuity in your cloud record that's just caused by it being really hard to observe clouds. So that was found, and we can't do much about that. We just have to know it's there. And then this is one of the more interesting problems we found that was in the Arctic, which is a study of Arctic trends. So this map shows dots representing trends of total cloud cover in the Arctic. And each dot is at a station. A big blue dot would mean a strong decline. A big red and white dot would be a strong increase. And so you see a lot of clustering of trends and fairly small values. I think the biggest value you see here is 8% per decade. And for the most part, there aren't many of them except for this line right here that looks incredibly suspicious and probably non-physical since everywhere around that isn't showing it, but that particular line is showing huge increases of cloud cover. So this was an issue that came out, well, this is a, pretty much the first thing I found working on this project in 2003. And it, wound up being a discontinuity at the distant early warning line, which is another Cold War relic where we had all these radar stations that were meant to detect Soviet bombers coming over the poles. But by the mid-80s, bombers were obsolete and the radar stations were basically useless. So in 1985, there was a command issued to all the observers to only report weather when it was significant, which means only when there's a storm. Mm -hmm. So you see the cloud record go from something that's kind of reasonable and interesting to suddenly always cloudy. And that's because these observation change occurred. So we found this and actually wrote to some people who were part of the dew line who verified this was an observation change and told us the whole story about it. So unfortunately, we had to drop these stations from our record. But before 1985, there is some useful cloud data here. It's just unfortunate how early it ended. And then a similar thing happened in Russia. We were looking at some Russian stations out in Siberia and saw en enormous, probably non-physical trade-off between precipitating cumulus clouds and precipitating stratus clouds, which it seems very unlikely that's real. But just to be sure, we compared it with the high cloud record and the cumulus cloud record, that maybe there was a huge change just to, just to see. And there was absolutely no change in the high and cumulus. So it's very unlikely there was a giant trade-off to convective precipitation without any changes in the cumulus or high cloud record. So we found about 30 stations that were showing this. We have no explanation for why it suddenly changed, but we got rid of the stations from the climatology. And so this is, this is, that's two examples of these strange observing procedures that change, and there's, there's more that we've gotten rid of in this way. So the last thing I'll talk about are the subtle international differences that we're seeing in observing procedure. This is where, even though you're supposedly training everyone to take observations in the same way, there are still international distance differences that showed up. So when Steve Warren and Carol Hahn were first plotting data in the 80s and 90s, they would see international boundaries show up for certain cloud types. So you would see like one kind of stratocumulus in Germany and a different kind in, in France. And this was disheartening, but what they wound up doing was combining types until these differences went away the best they could. So instead of 30 total cloud types, we wound up with just nine plus total cloud cover. And so we combined the, the five, the uh, 10 low cloud types originally to just five. We have a fog, stratus, stratocumulus, cumulus, and cumulonimbus. Just three middle cloud types, nimbus stratus, alto stratus, or alto cumulus, and a single high cloud type, because there was an enormous lot of differences between the uh, different high clouds reported in different countries. So. so it's unfortunate to lose that, but we have some record of it at least. So throughout this talk, I sort of combine these in different ways, you'll see. We'll be looking at cumulus sometimes, or precipitating only sometimes, or all low. So you can do that and just look at different versions and different pieces of the, the record, however you want to. And this problem was actually even more pronounced and more of a problem over the ocean, where the countries of origin of ships have changed over time. And we think this is, so you have a different representation over the ocean of different countries at any given time, and it's looks constantly drifting. And there's a couple papers about this, but what you see on these figures is these, these gray lines represent zonal average cloud amount in 10 degree latitude zones. And if you look closely, they all follow each other, which is really odd. So basically, this is showing that at minus 20 degrees south, the same long-term variation is being seen 
as 30 degrees north, which seems really unphysical and unlikely. And we're still not really sure what's causing it, but we wanted to make sure it wasn't real, so we tested it against island data. We took an area of the Pacific Ocean and looked at ship observations that basically coincided spatially with island observations to see if the same long-term variations were present. We did it by breaking the record down into a long-term variation, which was approximated by a polynomial, sort of a, high, a low degree polynomial that you can see in those thick curves, and then the residual would be the, the time series minus the polynomial, and we correlated both sets. Does that make sense? And so, and so far what we saw was that there was basically no agreement at the long-term time scales, but at the short-term time scales, correlation was close to 0.7. So they were definitely seeing the same variation, but for whatever reason, the long-term variability was split. It was just not related between the two. So this is still an issue in the ocean data. We haven't gotten rid of it in the main data product, but in all the trends I show using the ocean data, we remove the long-term variation as a polynomial to get rid of any spurious trends caused by weird observing procedures. It just still lets us look at a lot of regional trends, but the global trend in ocean data is probably not reliable from this data set. So onto the results, this is a map of trends in total cloud coverage, the annual average. And each number represents a 0.1% per decade or a percent per century. And what I wanted to point out was that the overall average global trend is pretty small, only minus a half percent per decade. But in individual little clustered areas, you'll see larger trends, little groups of coherent trends. So it's like sub-Saharan Africa, you see an increase, as well as over the island stations over the Pacific, you'll see some increase. But you also see a lot of decreasing over areas like China, South Africa, South America, and Australia. So even though the global record doesn't show much change, there's definitely a lot happening in individual continents and individual climate regimes. And these maps are available for all of our cloud types, all nine of them plus total cloud cover, for all seasons, plus an annual average for day and night. So if you're ever interested in amounts or trends of cloud cover anywhere you're working, we have that data for this time period. So over the ocean, this is the same kind of map, but with the, the uh, global polynomial taken out. So there's no global trend, but this is, this is the, basically the residual trends seen after that polynomial is removed. And you still see some interesting stuff, like a, an in, a strong increase of 2% per decade or so in the Central Pacific, some declines around the Arctic and the Southern Ocean, and some very small declines in stratocumulus decks off the west coast of the major continents. But in general, these trends are really pretty small. And also we're seeing a very large, maybe one of the more interesting things that no one's really figured out what's going on yet is this increase in the Indian Ocean. There seems to be a pretty well-documented increase in cloud cover south of India. And this is still, no one really knows what's going on with that, so it'd be good to see that more. And these are also available for all seasons and all cloud types. So moving on to the Arctic, this is trends in precipitating cloud cover during the Arctic summer. This is probably one of the most interesting and yet unexplained maps from my work because we don't really know why this decline is happening or whether it's spurious or not. But it seems like over much of the Arctic, the combined precipitating cloud cover, nimbus stratus and cumulonimbus, is showing decreases with just small areas of increases north of North America and in Siberia. And making it more difficult is that the Siberian increase seems to be caused by convective clouds, whereas a North American increase seems to be caused by stratiform clouds. And then we have that problem in Russia with the stations showing that trade-off. So there's really no telling what's going on here, but it definitely needs further work. So we're not sure if the decline in precipitating clouds is coming from maybe changes in just the warming Arctic, if it's dynamically driven, or maybe it's driven by pollution that would cause longer lasting clouds that would be less likely to precipitate. We're not really sure. So it needs to be looked into as well. And our cloud data database also allows for the computation of diurnal cycles. So if you ever want to know the diurnal cycle of a cloud, cloud amount, cloud type, we have maps for that as well. So what you see is a harmonic, basically sine wave fit to the three hour average cloud amount at a weather station. And you can see a strong signal of stratiform cloud cover peaking in the morning, declining in the afternoon and reforming overnight. And for each one of these plots, we've created one for each grid box and then assigned a phase and an amplitude to it. 
So the phase tells you what time the cloud maximum occurred. The amplitude tells you how big the diurnal cycle is. And this map shows dots where the color corresponds to the phase and the, the size corresponds to the amplitude of the cycle. So these are available also for the all low clouds over the ocean and land. And you see pretty reasonable numbers where stratiform cloud cover peaks when you'd expect it to in the early morning, cumuliform in the afternoon after peak solar heating. And finally, we, we correlated time series of cloud cover at each weather station with a time series of the Indian summer monsoon. We did this with a bunch of other indices as well, but this one showed the best map. Where, we, where it, The only thing that's correlating with cloud cover here is a record of the winds blowing in towards India. That is the only data going into the, the time series being correlated with cloud cover all over the globe. And it's pretty amazing how many different parts of the world actually light up when you correlate the cloud record just with the Indian monsoon index. You see variability in the Arctic, North America, you see it in South Africa, South America, Australia. So you can see, using this record, it's so coherent and so big that you can actually see these things globally and get a feel for you know, what cloud types might be changing, what the weather might be doing when you have these indices that change. So we haven't really put a lot of work into this yet, but if somebody wants to work on this, it's a great thing to do. It would be a great thing to look at and check out. So one of our best results was a poleward migration of the storm tracks that we we calculated this by looking at the zonal distribution of cloud cover and looking at the yearly variation in that. And the way we did it was set up an average zonal mean distribution of cloud cover using five by five degree latitude zones. And you can see in this figure definite signs of where the Hadley cell is, right? You see a storm track in the southern hemisphere, a, a descending region where you would have deserts and very little cloud cover, tropical convection, and the same on the north, the northern hemisphere. And our question was, can we track the movement of these regions, and how would you do it? So to, to do it, we, had to, we couldn't turn our station time series into anomalies, so we had to instead kick out all but the very best stations. So this is a, using a subset of about 1,200 stations that are missing no essentially no observations. I think we, we allowed them to miss two so we had more sampling in the Southern Hemisphere. And we established a center to each one of these regions that is the, the center of the area under the curve. So we calculated the area under the curve and found the point latitude-wise where you're in the exact middle. We did that for every year and tried to see if the distribution of these things was changing north to south. Does that make sense? And so we plotted the distribution of the changes in that and actually found that it looks like the Hadley cell is actually expanding according to the cloud record. What you see in the northern hemisphere before and after the North American stations dropped out, you see a slight wander towards the pole in the uh, storm track. So the cloud maximum associated with the storm track seems to be moving poleward in both hemispheres. Same with the cloud minimum, it seems to be moving poleward less. The gray lines show trends that are insignificant, while the black dark lines are significant. So in each of the non-tropical Hadley cell zones, you wind up seeing widening of the Hadley cell, which is consistent with the global warming signal. We're also seeing a northward migration of the convection in the tropics, which is still unexplained. So that tempers it a bit, but it's still pretty interesting. And we did this over the ocean as well, but the ocean has that interesting problem with uh, polynomial variation. So we actually saw a greater displacement of the dry zones over the ocean compared to the storm track. So there's some asymmetry, but a global composite of all this did show a similar result of the Hadley cell expanding. So one thing we wanted to do was to look at the variability in that time series and see if it was actually real. It looked like a pretty promising result, but what we really wanted to do was prove that what we were seeing was real variation. And the way to do it is to compare it with the El Nino index, because when the El Nino is strong and positive, it contracts the Hadley cell. There's several papers showing that. And so we just correlated the northward displacement of each one of those zones with the ENSO index and saw the correlations you'd expect to see, which adds a lot of credence to the variability in that time series. So when ENSO is high, the northern jet stream tends to descend a little bit towards the equator, while the southern jet tends to move northward towards the equator. Same with the dry zones. So we felt pretty good about that, that result after also looking at ENSO and seeing that they really correlate pretty well. 
And finally, over the Arctic, this is what I did my master's thesis work on years ago. We wanted to see if there was a cloud response to thinning Arctic sea ice. And the way to do that was to sort of isolate the Arctic to an area where sea ice was most variable, which is between the Beaufort and the Laptev seas. That's where, at least in the early 2000s, the most variability was occurring with the ice thinning and going away. So we looked at the cloud record just in this area, and we tried to compare it to the, to the sea ice record to see if we could see any agreement or any, any kind of signal. And so what we did was we took the sea ice record and looked at the five highest ice years and the five lowest ice years, which are shown by squares and dots, and then compared it to the low cloud record coinciding with that, and just composited the high ice years and the low ice years. And what we saw was about a 14% difference between the two, and pretty strong anti-correlation. Even if you pull the trends out with a polynomial, you'll see the variations correlate pretty well. Whenever there's high September sea ice, it seems like you have a less cloudy Arctic in that region. Whereas if you have a thin ice cover, you end up with a lot more low cloud cover where the ice is thin. So because this is a September sea ice anomaly, and then you have coinciding September, October, November, cloud anomaly, it seems like the cloud response is more of a response than a driver of the sea ice change, but there's definitely something going on where you have more open water, and so you wind up with more cloud cover. And then this actually acts as a positive feedback, we think. Well, there's a lot more going on here than just clouds and ice. If you do increase the cloud cover in the late autumn and the ice is thin, you're going to wind up with more downwelling infrared. You'll wind up warming the surface and inhibiting the refreezing of the sea ice. So it seemed like a very possible positive feedback seen in the Arctic that could exacerbate sea ice loss. But this is one part of you know, millions of different things happening in the Arctic, so it's hard to say how dominant this is. So what we'd like to do in the future is look more into things like this, look at the variability in the cloud record, and really look at what was locally forced versus what can be explained by remote variation. So you saw the Indian monsoon had a huge effect on cloud cover everywhere. We'd like to see what, what part of the cloud record in the Arctic has to do with really changes in that index versus what's going on locally in the Arctic. So separating those two out is going to be a challenge, but I think we have some methods to figure that out. We'd like to look at more types. This is just low types, but I think if we added the individual types, the individual obs into this, you could see a lot more signal and a lot more idea of what's going on with the depth of the boundary layer, how the clouds differ, how the base heights maybe differ when you have different ground uh, or ice cover. And we'd like to look at land areas as well, because that's where maybe even more changes are occurring. You're getting vegetation changes, you're getting permafrost changes. Lots of different things are happening over the land, and so there's probably a cloud response to that too, but we haven't had a chance to look really closely at it. So this is something that is ongoing, and hopefully we can continue working on it here. So concluding, the surface cloud record does offer the longest current available record of cloud cover, starting in the 70s or the 50s, so we're looking at you know, 40, 50 years of data. Uh, the peculiar irregularities associated with the OBS really requires careful vetting. There's a lot of averaging techniques and ways to avoid bias that need to be taken into account. The global scale trends according to the surface observed cloud record are not very large. You know, there have been some satellite cloud climatology projects that have shown big trends and we're just not seeing that with the longer record with the surface OBS. So we don't know if, why they disagree. We have some ideas, but it's not. They don't totally agree right now. I tend to believe the smaller trends, to be honest. And looking at changes in types really give us an idea of how the atmosphere is changing more than just in like a whether it's cloudy or not phase, but maybe we can, they can tell us whether you have a cumulus trade-off to, to stratus or you know, more high, more middle. All these things can be discerned by the cloud types and the cloud record and the distribution of them. Um, these surface OBS are available to allow a good, easy study of diurnal cycles. Uh, that correlate really well with a lot of different indices, because we also did similar maps to that monsoon index maps with El Nino, with PDO, NAO, and each one of them lit up in a similar way. So we know the variability is real, and there's a lot of variability to be seen over the world. Uh, the changes in the zonal distribution of the cloud record shows evidence the Hadley cell is expanding poleward. And the Arctic, the declines in sea ice are probably causing a cloud cover increase in the autumn that's leading to further declines in sea ice, possibly. So our future work is going to be focusing on these responses and emphasizing individual cloud types and the subtypes and trying to distinguish you know, surface forcing from remote forcing 
and all the things that will go along with that. So, thanks.